Hello and welcome to the latest Socialist Appeal podcast. Uh, I'm your host again for tonight, Adam Booth, the editor of Socialist.net, website of Socialist Appeal. Uh, and as ever, if you're not already following us on our social media channels, check us out on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, and of course the podcast. Uh, download it uh, for other episodes with history, theory, current events and analysis. Uh, tonight we're going to be joined in a second by Pamela Fitzpatrick, who's a Labour councillor and the former uh, pr pr parliamentary perspective candidate for Harrow East and also uh, was in the race to become the next general secretary to replace Jenny Formby. Uh, at the moment there is a contest going on for who would replace Jenny Formby and the decision is going to be made tomorrow. Unfortunately, Pamela did not make it uh, onto the final uh, shortlist, but she was in the running. Uh, standing on the left on a on a socialist program, and uh, we're going to be hearing from Pamela about uh, the, the the demands and the the, the changes that she was uh, interested in seeing, uh, and still obviously is interested in seeing in the Labour Party. So we're going to be talking about recent events in the Labour Party, and also obviously uh, her uh, role as a councillor and some of the situation at a local level. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to bring in Pamela in a second. Hi, Pamela. Can you hear us okay? Hi, Josh. Yes, I can. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so nice to see you tonight. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for joining us on this uh, warm summer's evening. Um, and as I was saying to the viewers a second ago, uh, you, uh, as well as being a Labour councillor and uh, and the, the, the prospective candidate for Harrow East in the last election, uh, you also put your hat into the ring for the upcoming uh, Labour General Secretary contest, uh, which isn't an election, uh, unfortunately, um, but uh, you were standing uh, to, to replace Jenny Formby. Can you uh, explain to, to viewers exactly why you thought it was important for, for someone like yourself, a left winger, to stand and what kind of changes uh, you would have liked to seen uh, if you had been given the chance to, to actually head up the Labour Party? Yes, thanks, Josh. Um, I have to say, I hadn't ever really thought about applying for any job to be an employee in the Labour Party. But when Jenny stood down, I started to get quite a few people contact me to say I should put myself forward. And initially, I completely dismissed the idea. Um, I didn't think it was for me. Um, however, <laughs> the request grew, so I was persuaded to at least look at the job description. And I did. And Throughout this period, many of you will know that we've had the issue of labour leaks and also subsequently the leaks from the GMB. And many people have been contacting me about that as well, who have been really distraught at the sort of culture that is in the Labour Party. And many people believe what was in the report because they've had experience of that type of behaviour. So I finally was persuaded to put myself forward. And then when I started to think about it, I thought it actually does need somebody who was going to go to it with an approach that you won't be, um, I suppose, corrupted, tribal, whatever you want, but will look at introducing kind of fair processes. So really, I started to give some thinking about what I wanted from the Labour Party and the General Secretary is in a key position and I must admit, before I decided to think about applying, I had been considering the issue about whether it should be an elected position or not. Um, but what I decided, I applied, and I thought that the kind of programme I should stand on is that the Labour Party, it sounds daft that I have to say this, but should embody socialist values. That's a, a core thing for the Labour Party for me. Um, that it should stand unreservedly on the side of the working class again you know we were formed of trade unions that never again should any trade union feel that the labor party is not a home for it and we've had that in the past we shouldn't again have that that we should utilize resources fairly that you know the general secretary if you agree with the sort of thinking that it shouldn't be an elected position because it's a bit like the civil service should be neutral so we shouldn't have resources being given to some people because they're favored and denied to others um crucially that i think and this was the core thing that drove me that there has to be fairness in its disciplinary procedure it shouldn't be used as a political tool it should be used fairly and applied to everybody. 
no matter what your rank or position in the party, you should all be subjected to it. Um, so those are some of the core things that drove me. Um, I have to confess, I didn't think I'd even get shortlisted. I was surprised because I didn't think that I would be wanted um, in that role, uh, nor the things that I was, was keen to promote. Um, but I was shortlisted to the first interviews and had my interview with um, 13 people on Zoom. Um, so yeah, that's why I stood and that's my experience of it. Thanks. And obviously, uh, Socialist Appeal have uh, supported you. And uh, we're sad, obviously, that you haven't made it to the final round, uh, as, as, as you were saying to me just before. Uh, Andrew Fisher, the only left winger uh, left on the list. But ra yeah. rather than speculating about who may get the job, because as we say, it's, it's appointed by the NEC, it would be interesting to hear a bit more about, you know, what you think, uh, you know, what are the changes that we need to see at the top of the Labour Party? Because as you mentioned, there's been the leaked report uh, which yeah. has been this huge bombshell uh, that a lot yeah. of grassroots members have been rightly enraged by. Um, what's your own feelings about the report? Um, I know you've spoken in other, uh, in other online meetings about it, but how, how do you feel about it now, you know, the, 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 you know a couple of weeks on, uh, the dust has settled to a certain degree? And, and what do you think needs to happen in terms of this investigation into the report? So, um, you know... In my day job, I work in a legal advice centre. Um, I'm a manager, so I'm used to dealing with issues that come up around staff behaviour. I'm a counsellor. I sit on the personal appeals panel within the council. So see at the end of disciplinary proceedings. I've been a trade union representative, not now, but for about 15 years. I represented people in both disciplinaries and grievances. So anybody, I read that report from start to finish, the whole 800 and I think 51 pages, anybody reading that would be horrified if it were true. Now, I also write lots of reports and I know I can see a report that has had a lot of input into it. I know there was people trying to trivialise it to say, well, this should have been cobbled together in the last days of Corbyn's kind of uh, reign. An 850 report, page report is not cobbled together. It's carefully referenced. It's all the kind of accounts are dated, attributed and, and noted. That's a carefully resourced report. If the content is true, and we have no reason to think it's not true because it's been so carefully put together and it has direct quotes from people and those people, as I believed that it's inaccurate, they've not denied it, they've complained about it being released, they called it a last ditch attempt to by Corbyn, but nobody appears to have denied the contents. So if that is true, it reveals one of the most dreadful things is that we have had to suffer a conservative government, the worst conservative government that I have ever known since 2010 the austerity, the people who've died, that we could undermine the possibility that we could have had a Labour government from 2017 is appalling. You know, people have died, people have suffered because of that. The fact that we have COVID-19 now, the crisis, that has highlighted so clearly the inequality, the discrimination in our society. And if we could have had a Labour government, I believe genuinely that fewer people would have died in this crisis. So it is absolutely atrocious if it is true. Many people, as I started off by saying, believe it's true because we've experienced it. I've experienced that mm. culture. Mm. You know, I was a victim in 2016. So it's, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and do you that. think on, on that question, um, do you think that the report has confirmed suspicions that yourself and others already had in terms of the kind of shenanigans and the sabotage going on within the party? Yes, definitely. Um, I was shocked because the language is so horrendous in it. But I was not surprised and we knew that this was going on. We knew the people involved in it. You know, I have lots of emails from some of the people named in that report. And so not surprised, but still shocked at how vicious it was. And really, you hope for the best in people, don't you? 
you know, I've been involved in the Labour Party a long time. I've always gone out and canvassed for candidates, even when they're pretty different views to mine, because I've always believed the Labour Party is the only vehicle that you can achieve some kind of uh, equality, justice, fairness. Mm -hmm. And to see that some people, for they don't care about that. All they're caring about is their own sort of personal, uh, personal ambition, really, I suppose, and power. Mm -hmm. And I guess that brings us on back to the question of the general secretary position, because um, if you've got these these uh, officials in the Labour Party uh, who are appointed, uh, like the general secretary and the other staffers who then obviously are, are, you know, they're divorced from the membership in the sense of the, the membership don't know who these people are necessarily. They don't have any control over them. It raises the question of accountability of party staffers, and in particular, the general secretary who's supposed to be overseeing the the, the whole uh, setup. So, do you think, uh, going back to what you were saying earlier, that this should be an elected position, that the membership should have more of a direct say over who the general secretary is? I do actually. So, I've given that quite a lot of thought because. For me, it seems like what would be the reasons not to have it as an elected position? So everybody else on the NEC actually is elected, aren't they? Whether they're there as a MP or an MEP previously, or the elected members come up through the trade unions or through uh, the CLPs. So what would be the argument against it? And the argument against it, I could only see, is that really it should operate as a kind of civil service that's neutral, that keeps things running, not having that political kind of strategy. But we know that doesn't happen anyway. It's highly politicised. And if I had any doubts about that, I'd just need to go back and read the report mm -hmm. to see. So if you remove that, what other reason is there not to have it as an elected position? So some of you may have seen, I do tweet quite a lot about what happens. And probably um, the, in my interview, okay, I was interviewed by um, 13 people and I wasn't shortlisted. Okay, that's fair enough. I might not have done a good enough interview, but I heard that I hadn't been put through to the final stage by Sunday Times journalists tweeting about it, not by the normal ch channels. So it's highly political already. And we ought to have some system that it's taken out of the hands of a few people to control who becomes the general secretary and to use that position in a way that is not to the benefit of the membership, but also to the wider community. We need a Labour government. That is it. We don't need a general secretary that's going to be there to prop up any one person. The Labour Party is bigger than any one person, no matter what rank they hold in the party. So I think, actually, yes, it should be. That might seem kind of ironic that I applied for it, but given the short time of the uh, um, ad and everything, I really mm. didn't have much time to campaign about it being an elected position. Mm. And that's another thing I should say. You know, again, in my job, I do a lot of recruitment. I've never known that a post to be recruited so to so quickly, you know, between the advert and the closing date, there was only initially, I think it was about a week, not much longer, and for the top job in the Labour Party, pretty quick. And it was extended, but then fairly, you know, short process. And two interviews even is quite, you know, not much really. So it does feel that it needs some change. And the other problem with it, you know, I'm a great trade unionist. I'm a Unite member. I've been a Unite shop steward. But this notion that it can be shared around the three big trade unions and that it's just somebody's turn can't be right for what's best for the party and for the wider sort of public. So, yes, I think I'm convinced and we should argue for it in the future. Uh, and do you think that on, on the same line of questioning, um, do, you, do you think the same uh, approach has to apply when it comes to parliamentary candidates as well, in the sense that uh, you know, we need to be fighting for open selection, greater democratic control over who represents the party, not just at HQ, but also obviously more importantly in Parliament and at a local level in councillors. Um, are you in favour of open selection? Is that something you would have pushed for as General Secretary? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, councillors are a bit more subject to open selection than parliamentary, than MPs. Um, and I have to confess, five years ago, I wasn't that convinced about open selection but the last five years and the type of conduct that's outlined in that report 
is why I now believe it's absolutely essential. Because that type of conduct isn't just going on in, in head office, it's actually in CLPs. Mm. And that needs to change. It really needs to change. So if an MP feels under threat, then they will target people that they feel threatened by. So it has to change. So I'm absolutely for that. I don't think there's any argument against it. I'm sure MPs will find a reason to argue <laughs> against it. Um, but otherwise, I think, you know, and, you know, people have even suggested to me we should have a limit of two terms for MPs. You know, other people have come up with even kind of more imaginative suggestions that we should have a jury system for MPs. It's just your turn that you do it. I probably wouldn't go that far. But we have to change. We can't have this system where an MP will use their resources to protect their own position rather than what's best for the constituency. So, yes, I'm fully in favour. And just going back to that question of the leaked report, then, um, it, what what do you think is going to happen now with this investigation? Because the some of, there's been some question marks over the panel that they've appointed. Um, one of them is a, a declared Keir Starmer supporter. One of them used to be uh, actually in charge of the Labour Party, the General Secretary, back in the 80s under Kinnock, which was a famous kind of witch hunting period against socialists. Uh, so it doesn't fill me as a grassroots member with a great deal of optimism that we're going to see justice out of this. What do you think might yeah. be the outcome? Is it going to, you know, be a case of kicking it into the long grass? And what do you think needs to be seen? What kind of what would justice look yeah. like in this scenario? So um, you can't prejudge the outcome of what should happen, but nothing has happened in the early stages so what should happen is that people should be suspended pending investigation what happens at the end of that investigation obviously you can't say because it depends on the facts and accuracy of everything but the fact that nobody has been suspended and some of those people who are named and very prominent in the report are on twitter you know as though they have not a care in the world now i contrast that with some people back in 2016 and 17, who were suspended, who it devastated their world. And I was contacted by people like somebody who was in, um, had stage four cancer, and their kind of main social world was the Labour Party, and they were not able to go to meetings anymore. And it really devastated them. But the fact that you've got people behaving in this way indicates to me that they think that nothing is going to happen to them. They're totally unaccountable. And we've had a lot of talk this weekend about some people believing themselves to be above the law or rules with Dominic Cummings. Absolutely. But we have to also recognise that in our own party as well, that nobody is too big or too important to be subject to the same disciplinary rules as ordinary members. So what should happen is they are suspended. It's now two months on and nobody has been suspended. And let's just remind ourselves of what uh, is contained in that report. There are people who did not progress complaints of anti-Semitism because they wanted to undermine Jeremy Corbyn. Now that is appalling. Surely you should be suspended for that. There are racists, there are ableists, there are uh, misogyny, all of those things that have no place in the Labour Party. So they should be suspended. That's the starting point. Why have we got a separate investigation set up? I do not know. Why is it not just going through the normal disciplinary rather than this other separate investigation? But if you are going to set up a separate investigation, you know, I know Keir Starmer is very keen that our disciplinary procedure is kind of outsourced, privatised, if you like because we want it to be independent. Mm. So why have we got Labour Party people doing the investigation of those named in the report? Because they can't be independent, quite apart from the things that you raised. They're Labour Party people. So it makes no sense to me at all. And so it doesn't bode well for the outcome, really. And, and just moving uh, on to... Um, Sorry, with, with your other kind of hat on, if you like, as the, the prospective uh, parliamentary candidate for Harrow East, that was obviously a marginal mm -hmm. seat in the last election and one that was uh, also victim of smear campaigns uh, from, from the Tories and uh, from uh, Hindu nationalists, uh, Modi supporters, things like that. Um, what do you think were the reasons Labour lost, uh, not locally necessarily, but nationally, 
And and what do you think needs to change now in the whole approach of the Labour Party, the programme, uh, the, the strategy moving forwards from here to the next election? Oh, um, so I think the 2019 election was really always going to be difficult because of Brexit and because of us changing our position on Brexit. Um, that came up quite a lot. So I think that was a problem for us nationally. Um, that combined with, um, it's absolutely true that Jeremy Corbyn came up as an issue on the doorstep, but the reason he came up on the doorstep was because the press day and night told people how dreadful Jeremy Corbyn was. And when we tried to give people kind of the honest, you know, position on things, we would be told, but your own MPs say this, your own MPs support this. So it was reinforced. So that was a national thing. But locally, we had that kind of problem as well. So we had in Harrow East, we've got a large Jewish population and we've got a large Hindu population. And um, within the Hindu community, we had uh, the Tories were sending messages out by WhatsApp, really quite horrendous messages. And when we tried to counter that, we were told that high profile Labour people um, in Harrow and beyond um, agreed that Labour were anti-Hindu, which is absolutely untrue. So if you've got that message reinforcing all the negativity, it's really hard to win. So I think it was a combination of factors in Harrow East and beyond, really. And, you know, for example, on we work so hard in Harrow East, we really do. We have the second highest contact rate of any CLP. We have volunteers coming in their hundreds. And we, we were doing really well. And the week before, it looked like we might just do it. Um, but we didn't. And on election night, we had Labour councillors who were hanging around laughing and joking with the Tory MP. Mm. How can you, how can that possibly be? And so some of the volunteers who'd worked so hard were in tears actually at that. And this seems to be acceptable in the Labour Party. How can that be? It's mm. it's crazy. And 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 you've taken the step now to set up the socialist uh, campaign group for Labour councillors, um, which presumably is is obviously inspired by the socialist campaign group of Labour MPs, uh, headed up by Richard Bergen now. Um, can, mm -hmm. And this is obviously a, a very positive step forward to, to, to organise uh, socialist councils in the Labour Party. Um, mm -hmm. What what is the the programme of the group, and uh, what what kind yeah. of uh, aims do you have in mind? Yeah, so we haven't um, we've had we've had issued statements on particular issues, but we haven't had our first meeting yet. We've had a Zoom meeting, but um, the point is, I suppose initially to make people aware that some councillors are socialists because often people think there are not many of us around but there are and we've now got a kind of london group and we've got groups in the regions as well so we're building so it will be uh, an evolving program we haven't got there yet we're just in the very early stages to be honest and covid has kind of hit us quite hard but it's a really exciting initiative i think um, and also just to give support to one another, because you can feel quite isolated as a socialist counsellor. You're ignored quite a lot of the time. Any kind of, you know, <laughs> successes you have, uh, you know, uh, trivialised or whatever. So knowing that there's a whole body of other similar thinking counsellors is actually really good and supportive. So, And I mean, you mentioned uh, the pandemic. <laughs> Um, and what then are the issues you're facing as a councillor in relation to the pandemic? Um, because obviously this must be, uh, you know, chaotic time for local councils. Yeah. There's been huge cuts already to councils because of Tory austerity over the last decade. Now, yeah. obviously, budgets have been decimated by collapsing tax uh, revenue. Uh, services are being shut down. And it's a very uncertain time. So can you talk us through as a, as a, with your hat on as a councillor now, what are the issues you're yeah. facing in the community uh, with the with the kind of onslaught, the tsunami that's facing local councils? Yeah. So Harrow is one of the areas that's most affected by COVID-19. And we've had a high number of deaths. So anybody you talk to knows somebody who's been ill or even has died. 
Um, and Harrow, it was inevitable really that we'd have a high infection rate because uh, locally we have one of the lowest levels of social housing in London. So people are in overcrowded accommodation. We've got a very diverse community uh, with larger families. So they are living in very overcrowded accommodation. And we have people um, on the lowest le uh, level of, uh, the highest level of low pay in London, one of the highest levels. So you've got people in insecure work who've suddenly lost their job. We have lots of people who are self-employed with a low level of income, say as taxi drivers and things. So all of a sudden they're out of work and stuck in accommodation that's very small for their families and worried about infection, worried about their children's education, worried about money and literally people just having nothing to eat. But to be honest, this isn't too much of a surprise for me because I work for a legal advice agency anyway. So we've been seeing this for years actually and raising this and it's quite often covered up because people just don't see it. They think Harrow, leafy suburb, is not much poverty. But it's been like that for quite some time. I suppose the difference is that because of the living situation, so many people are getting ill and dying. And there was a case recently of an Uber driver who died because he didn't get help because he, his landlord, he'd already been evicted from one property because he was an Uber driver that people, the landlord thought he was gonna spread the virus. So he'd lost his home. So then he did get ill and he didn't ask for help because he was worried about his landlord finding out and he left it too late and he died. So I've literally, I mean, I've never been busier actually than since the lockdown. I'm working from home, but I'm constantly contacted as a counsellor, but also through my job, but also people who've held on to my leaflet from when I was a PPC and are contacting me. And it's often just people who've got no food, nothing at all nothing um or they're still at risk of being evicted because the landlord wants to throw them out the a high instance of domestic violence we had a high rate of that in harrow anyway so that's increased and people just genuinely worried about what's going to happen in the future and particularly for younger people it was bad enough before but you know what now and so many of the jobs are so insecure we think that there's going to be a massive recession and we're just not equipped for that. And I have to say the councils respond initially, and I think local authorities generally are really good in this type of crisis, but the government hasn't been forthcoming with the money that it said it would provide, which is not a surprise, I suppose. Um, and I'm just worried for the longer term. I think we're managing now, but what are the long-term prospects really? And, and so in terms of the long term, what, what kind of perspective do you have in terms of, you know, what should Labour members be fighting for in this period uh, on a local level, on a national level? It seems like we've got a government in crisis, uh, completely yeah. incompetent. And, you know, as, as we're seeing, you know, cut, we, how could we how could we have a show tonight without mentioning what's going on with Dominic Cummings? As you as you said earlier, you know, this government is, is being pulled in all sorts of directions, completely incompetent when it comes to fighting the pandemic. And then obviously mm -hmm. we've got a Labour Party that's undergoing a change in terms of a new leadership, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a new general secretary. So what should rank and file members, what should grassroots Labour members uh, and trade unionists as well? As you said, you're a trade unionist, uh, I'm a trade unionist. What should we be fighting for in the Labour movement on a local level and nationally uh, against not just, you know, not, not just to address the issues around the pandemic, but the long term mm -hmm. recession and even depression that we're going to be facing? Yeah. Well, at the moment, it's really hard to do anything because you can't have any meetings, any official meetings, so you can't pass any motions. And many a time over the last few weeks, I felt that we ought to be taking to the streets and protesting, and we can't even do that. So at the moment, it's very limited. And I think what you should be asking the Labour Party, first of all, is they've got to agree that uh, members can meet and pass motions, etc., through... Um, Zoom, you know, remote meetings, Zoom meetings, whatever. And then getting on to the kind of policy programme, what really worries me is that when you think back to the um, manifesto of 2019, 
it's everything we need now. You know, people are complaining about their internet not working at home, but they were ridiculing the proposals about mm. high-speed internet um, to have a decent sort of benefit system, which people are so surprised. That's one thing that people are contacting me and saying that this can't be right, the universal credit amount that I'm getting, can it? And they can't expect me to wait six weeks before I get any money. Well, yes, and it's always been that bad. It's really bad. Um, so we need a different benefit system, reinvesting in the NHS, of course, all of those basic things and funding local authorities so that they can deal with just basic issues, but also be ready for a crisis like this. So one of the things I would say, I'm really worried about the kind of current debate that somehow the manifesto was bad, was wrong. It wasn't, mm. and it has highlighted that so much. So we must not let that be changed. I am worried uh, about the direction of the party, which was one of the things that did persuade me to stand, despite my reservations for the general secretary. So I think, you know, Keir Starmer, he uh, got elected really on certain promises and we need to hold him to those promises. And we need to ensure that, that everybody talks about democracy, you know, but what does it mean really? Because it's, it's all very well talking about, I guess, we must make the Labour Party more democratic. How? How's that going to happen, really? Um, so I would say, first of all, start pressing Labour to hold proper meetings where party members can pass motions. We are not going to have annual conference. So how are we mm. going to translate <clears throat> those kind of policies um, into kind of party policy? Um, your MP, if you've got an MP that will listen to you to try to persuade them that we need to not go back on the sort of policies that we had in the manifesto. It's going to be a bit of an uphill battle, I think, um, but we need to do it. No, exactly. <clears throat> agree, agree 100%. Uh, it's going to be a fight, but thankfully, uh, yeah, I think people are, people are up for it. And... Uh, um, yeah, thanks very much for taking the time uh, today to talk to us and, and to viewers about your thoughts. Uh, I know it's a busy, very busy time for you, as as you say. Uh, so really appreciate you taking the time out uh, to actually speak to us tonight. And uh, obviously solidarity uh, as a councillor, as a, as a, hopefully a candidate in the next election uh, for Harrow East again. Uh, and uh, sorry that you didn't make it through to the, the final uh, round of the General Secretary, but uh you know we'll we'll obviously be uh supporting you uh every other uh, level that we can thanks very much josh okay all right, all right. thanks for joining us no, bye for now bye and thanks to everyone who's joined us at home uh and uh as i said at the beginning if you haven't already followed us on uh, on the youtube channel on uh, facebook on twitter please do so and of course, if you want to get involved in the fight that we've just been talking about in the fight for a socialist Labour government, for socialist policies, uh, then get involved with us by going to socialist.net forward slash join uh, or forward slash subscribe or donate in order to support us in the struggle for socialism. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you again soon. We're living through a decisive turning point in history. Tens of thousands of people are dying. The world economy is in freefall. This is the barbarism of the capitalist system. It can't be patched up. It must be replaced. We have the resources to meet everyone's needs and the planet. A rational, planned, socialist economy is possible. A society based on need, not profit. But we have to fight for it. We need to get educated in revolutionary theory and history. We need to spread our ideas and we need to organise ourselves. So join Socialist Appeal, the Marxist and the Labour and Student Movement. Join our